Well, thank you, Dale, and good morning. Yes, my name is Anthony, and as Dale mentioned, um, was a was a longtime member um, back in the day. You know, you call it Throwback Thursday, but I guess it's Sunday today. So, um, yes, I'm back and and blessed to be here. This church, uh, growing growing in my high school ages, this church was was fundamental in in my discovery of Christ, and this is a great opportunity for me to give back a little bit to this church. Um, the Adams family has been uh, nothing but supportive of me ever since I stepped foot in this church in 2002. Um, I was actually, I remember it was freshman year, and in, in freshman year of high school, you know, it's, a, it's an awkward time, you don't know a lot of people, and you're real nervous what high school is going to bring you. And I remember I was sitting in my German class, and I was sitting next to this girl named Paige Adams. And Paige Adams and I were just chatting, we had a conversation, and got to asking, you know, I had never been to church really growing up, and so I kind of was playing out the field and seeing if there was any churches available, and she said, yeah, there's one down off of College Street, and that's the one I go to, she says. I said, oh, great. I said, that sounds interesting. I said, how's the pastor? She goes, well, the pastor's my father. I'm like, okay, cool. So, how's the pastor? <laughs> she, she didn't seem to have anything bad to say about him, so decided to show up and uh, kind of never stopped coming other, you know, other than traveling and the like. So, um, yes, throughout my four years um, in high school, I was able to, to learn a lot um, here at Paramount, which was then called College Street. And, uh, and then I went on to Whitworth University, which is a private Christian school over in Spokane, Washington, um, and got my bachelor's degree in psychology with minors in theology and dance. So while I'm up here, you'll see me swaying and fidgeting. That's the dancer in me. Um, it's not necessarily nerves. It's more just uh, excitement. And when I get excited, my body starts doing weird things. So I apologize. Um, if you do get sick, you know, the, there's lots of exits. So. Um, anyway, so from Whitworth, I went on and uh, went out to Korea. I taught English for two years in South Korea. Um, teaching kindergarten students in a private school. And at the same time, I also got the blessing of ministering in a Korean Christian church. And it was 250 plus straight Korean people and then me. And I stand out a little bit in a Korean church. Relatively tall, um, pretty fair-skinned. My hair is a little different color than most. Um, and uh, so they kind of they kind of noticed me right when I got there, um, but that was a blessing because I got to do a lot of great things in that church. Even if I didn't speak the language right away, you know, you learn body language, things like that, and eventually you pick up on on what they're saying. Or you know, if somebody smiles when they say something, hopefully they're saying something nice. If if they're really loud, their eyebrows are raised, and you know hands coming up, uh, you might be upset. Anyway, you pick up on these things and you usually just learn to say thank you and walk away. Um, but I was able to, uh, to do different sermons, I was able to do dance re presentations while I was out there, um, I was able to teach the youth, we did Bible studies, we did English lessons, just a variety of things. We also did a, a ministry trip. We um, planted a church in Cambodia, so I got to go on a mission trip out there to their, their new church in Cambodia and serve out there. Uh, I've done a few trips to, to Jamaica as well that I've led um, while I was in college. I came back to the States after my two years teaching, and uh, the Lord was like, hey, you're going to join the military. And I was like, no, I'm not. He was like, I'm God. And I was like, well, that's a good point. So I decided to join the military, and um, God won that one. And so I am a, a behavioral health specialist, which is like an entry-level counselor in the U.S. Army. And uh, after basic training and my technical school, they're like, hey, we're going to send you to this place called South Korea. Um, what do you know about this place? I was like, hmm, I know a few things. I've, I, you know, I did a little research. So anyway, I, they sent me out to Korea for a year. And uh, so that's a total of three that I spent in that, that lovely country. Um, and I got the opportunity to serve um, in, in basically my home away from home. And then uh, after that, they're like, hey, how about we send you to Joint Base Lewis McCord in Tacoma, Washington? I was like, ah, oh, man. This is tough. Like, military is really hard for me, you know? They're sending me to all these great places, and, and I get a, get a minister. So I was like, all right, I guess. So here I am. Um, I'm, I'm here for a little while. You guys are stuck with me. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and a blessing to be back. When guest speakers um, are presenting at a church, oftentimes we find ourselves asking, you know, who is this person? Um, and I know for me, I got to thinking, why, why me? How, how did I deserve to be up here? Um, you know, what makes me worthy? And 
and it's, it's nothing, nothing. That's what's cool about it. Nothing makes me worthy of being up here to speak. Um, nothing I've done, at least. Uh, but the work of, of Christ on the cross uh, is exactly what allows me to be up here and to just you know, be his messenger. It's his words and not mine. And so uh, what, a, what a blessing it is to be here today. So uh, can you please bow your heads and pray with me? <sighs> Heavenly Father, just uh, we lift you up today, and we thank you so much for for the opportunity to just come together in fellowship and to be here with, with your brothers and sisters, or your sons and daughters, rather, and our brothers and sisters. And Lord, I am a fallen and broken man, and I've done nothing to be up here, nothing to deserve the blessings that you pour in my life, Lord, but for whatever reason you chose me, and you chose to die on the cross for me and for us, and for that, I thank you. And Lord, we also pray that you be with Pastor Jeff as he's out serving the Dominican Republic, and just bless his words. Allow him to speak through you, or please speak through him, rather, Lord. And uh, just be with the Adams family in this time of grievance as well, um, and be with this sermon. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today our, our passage comes from Galatians 5. Um, Galatians is, of course, it's written by Paul, and, uh, and Paul's writing to the, the people in Galatia, the Christians, and this is kind of a... Like back to the heart of worship kind of book, where he's just saying, we need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to the real gospel. We need to stop letting these, these minuscule foreign concepts coming into our church, and, and we need to just get back to the basics where we're, we're worshiping God with a full heart and a pure heart. And, and it's, it's a beautiful book. I definitely recommend um, jumping into it. And we're just going to do uh, chapter 5, verses uh, 1 through 13 today, or rather 1 through 15. So we're going to start in verse 1, and it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Um, when, when Pastor Jeff asked me if I would be willing to speak, um, naturally I said, yes, absolutely, let's do it, I'm down. Uh, he was like, okay, cool, we're going to have you speak on the weekend before the 4th of July. I said, wow, that's pretty neat, um, that's fitting, I, I, like, um, I like freedom, and I like the 4th of July, so I'd love to, um, that would be a blessing. You know, I even, I got my freedom socks on for those who can see them, you know, American flag socks, so I was ready to go, right? Um, but... When I started doing some research, I was looking at, you know, what, what, what is freedom in regards to the Christian faith? And what does that look like? And this is exactly what it looks like. It looks like Christ saying, your freedom is because of me. It's because of what I've done. So it's not because of anything that I've done to deserve it. It's called grace. Now, when I was in my, one of my theology classes at Whitworth University, I had a professor, uh, Keith Beebe. And Professor Beebe would, uh, he was... He was infamous for having bizarre ways of teaching things, but he always seemed to remember them. And one of those things that he taught us was the definition of grace. And he said when he was in school, he had a professor um, whose voice was just very distinct. It was very high-pitched, hard to listen to, um, and, and memorable. So he said that she would always repeat her definition of grace, which is the undeserved love of God. And he said you have to say it that way, or she won't hear it. So when she would ask the class, what is the definition of grace? And they would respond in their own voices, the undeserved love of God. She'd be like, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you just said. I didn't understand. So everybody in the class would have to say, the undeserved love of God. And you know, so they would all roll their eyes. But inevit you know, inevitably, it, it led to them remembering that's the foundation of grace. Grace is the undeserved love of God. So we did nothing to deserve this freedom that we've been given, to deserve this love. Um, Christ just went up on the cross and was like, hey, I'm just going to go ahead and do this for you. And that's, that's pretty cool. That's one of those things like when I'm having a hard time in my faith or I'm feeling distant from God and I say, Lord, I just need to draw near you. What can I do to feel your presence again in my life right now? Um, I'm very visual, so I'll close my eyes and I'll envision the cross. And I'll envision Christ up there. And usually I'm, I'm pretty close to him, which makes it pretty graphic. Um, and that's what I need. I need to see him up there and see him struggling and in pain and bleeding, and he'll whisper his, like, his last words, and he'll just be like, Anthony, this, this is, I'm doing this for you. And that's incredibly humbling. That really strikes me, and I'm just like, Lord, <laughs> I, I did nothing to deserve that, but you know what? Like, 
I'm going to see what I can do for you uh, in return for that. And that's, that's one thing that I do, um, and I know that, that we all have our own different ways and techniques, but when I think about freedom itself, I get to thinking about North Korea. You know, I worked, like I said, in the South for a while, um, but the South is, is far different from just that place just a little on the other side of the border. Um, Kim Jong-un is, um, he's a different kind of leader than what we have. Um, so we'll just, we'll keep it at that. But he has some interesting ways about him. You know, we hear about the things as far as, we hear about him trying to send satellites up and they fail. We hear about all these different, you know, missile launches and nuclear testing and things like that that he's doing or maybe not doing. But then, you know, like two weeks ago, I saw in the news, he was, he found a cure to Ebola, HIV, and MERS all in one, you know, and it was a big miraculous cure, but I haven't heard anything since. So one of the things that we don't hear, though, about North Korea is that we don't always see the treatment of his people, of the North Korean citizens, what they live like on a daily basis. The, in, the poverty that they live under is just, it hurts when you do learn about it, when you see it. And it's something that, you know, dehumanization is, is no joke. And that's something that North Korean citizens live under on a daily basis. Freedom isn't real for them. It's not, it's not a concept that they can grasp. You know, there was, there's a story of Barabbas. Barabbas was, um, he was in his cell waiting for his impending due, which was death on the cross. And Barabbas was, you can only imagine, just picturing, you know, well, this is it. This is this is you know all my all my all my faults have, have led to this. I'm I'm gonna die, and this is just it's going to happen. And so he hears the hears the guards coming, and he hears the rattling of the keys, and he prepares himself. And the guards open the gate, and they say, "All right, uh, you're free. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth is gonna take your spot on the cross." Wow. Now what? Now now what do I do? You know, I just imagine that feeling, like wow. And that, that's us, right? We are, we are Barabbas. Um, we deserved that death, but Christ took it for us. And so one of the things that I think we need to do is we need to stand firm in our freedom. You know, this, is, this upcoming weekend, the 4th of July, is a great opportunity for us to say, God, thank you. Thank you for this freedom. Thank you for the opportunity to just do what I want to do. You know, thank you for Facebook. What? Thank you for the opportunity for... You know, I, when I was in Korea, I got to communicate with my family. I got to see my niece and nephew growing up from so many thousands of miles away because of technology, because of things that we gripe and complain about on a daily basis. I include in that. We need to be able to be looking at God with a grateful heart and saying, Lord, thank you for this freedom. Thank you for the technology, for communication skills that we've been blessed with, or some of us not so blessed with communication skills. Um, but at the end of the day, we just need to be coming to the Lord, I think, with grateful hearts in this, uh, in this holiday weekend that's coming. Um, so when we, when we stand firm in, in our freedom and, and show gratitude toward that, one of the things we need to do as well is we need to be able to s save others, to show them the way to freedom, because they're locked, they're imprisoned by sin right now, and they need us. They need our assistance to reach out once we've found our own freedom in the Lord. In the next slide, you'll see verses 2 through 6 highlighted, and those read, Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. Now, a lot of times when I'm looking at Scripture, I feel like there's so many what nots. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't be this way. Don't be that way. And it really bogs me down because I'm like, man, is there anything I can do? You know, like what, 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 where, where are my... Yes, this is, this is a good guidance. This is something you should do, something you can do. So this, this section has both. It has what not to do and what you should do, what you can do, what you should be seeking out in the Lord. And so first, we'll have highlighted is what 
two things we should not be doing. One thing is not focusing. It says circumcision. It's talking about rituals, right? We're, not, we're, we're supposed to be coming to the fundamentals of the gospel, to the fundamentals of faith. Christ took on the burden of the law, and now we have a new law in the Lord, and we need to be investing into that, and we need to be investing into this church, into the gospel, and into fellowship. And those are the things that we need to be coming back to, coming back to the heart of true, pure worship. And that's, that's what he's saying. He's saying that that's, that's where we're falling short sometimes, and that's still true today, I believe, um, at least in my own life. The other thing it says not to do is to be, you know, we're not, it's not about being justified by the law, right? We have Christ, and therefore that gospel is embedded into our lives once we accept Jesus. And then it's our duty and our mission to do something with that. It's our mission to love the Lord and to love others and to serve them and to reach out. So it's not about being justified by the law. On the next slide, you'll see the two words. That are, that are important as far as what we can do. Um, one of those is eagerness, eagerly. So coming to the Lord and coming to faith with an eagerness, right? Um, it says that for, through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness, righteousness for which we hope. I don't think eagerness is something that we all have, myself included, on a daily basis in our faith. If anybody does, please raise your hand. I'll shake it and say you're doing incredible things. It's hard. It's hard to be eager on a daily basis. Wake up and say, Lord, I want to get into your word. Let me get into fellowship with you. Let me get into worship. Let me put some, some real heart into you. Some real one-on-one time with you. We can't, can't do that on a daily basis, but we can try. Right? Eagerness is something that we have a little bit of control over. So if we wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I want to be more eager for you. Give me that. Put that on my heart. Be amazed by some of the things that he'll do because that's not something that comes naturally to us. We're eager to, you know, get a get a new Xbox, or we're eager to get a new car, or we're eager to get to the fireworks show, or whatever the case may be. Uh, Let's try and be a little more eager for the Lord, and that definitely uh, that definitely counts for me as well. The other thing that's in this verse is love. Love is, is a concept that I, you know, I'm always thinking about and I'm always considering just because my, one of my favorite verses is 1 John 4, 16, which says, God is love. Um, so well, it starts out with whoever, so we know and rely on the love God has for us. And then it says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And that phrase, when people ask me what is love, I just want to say God, right? That's the quick and easy answer because that's what it says. God is love. So when we accept God into our heart, we accept love. We don't always make note of that. We're accepting love into our lives. We are being loved on a daily basis by our Lord and Savior. But what are we doing with that? People say love is an action word. It's a verb. It is. Love is an action word. It's something you do. How are you loving others? What are you doing to show love to other people? But it's also a feeling. You have to have it in your heart. You can't just give somebody something, do something for someone. They won't feel it. They won't feel God's presence in that unless you're really doing it from the heart. And that's another thing that I don't think is discussed as much when we talk about love. See, if I'm going to go serve the homeless and I'm just giving them sandwiches and I just keep on walking by them, cool, I fed them. They're good for the next meal. If I give them a sandwich, I look down and and I I just say, hey, can we we sit down? I just want to chat with you, see what else you need, get to know you a little bit. That's when they're going to feel that, because I really genuinely care. You know, you'll meet people in your walk and in life that just they emanate this love. They emanate this light. And when you meet them, you just feel it. And you're like, man, that person lifts me up. You know, that person really, I don't know what it is about them, but they draw me in, and I really like it. That's God. That's a heart of love. And so those people aren't just serving just because they're supposed to serve. They're serving because their heart's in it and because they're really genuinely loving on you. And that's something that I think we miss sometimes. So we read on, verses 7 through 12. It says, You are running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. That's a strong 
Strong verse. And it's showing Paul's passion. He's saying, I don't want anybody to get in your way. I don't want anybody to bring you down. And when they do, God's going to take care of them. Okay, but dust yourself off and keep going. And you know what? While you're going, bring everybody else with you. Okay, help them out. But you've got to help yourself first. And you've got to pull out those weeds that are in your life. And we've got to work through those and get rid of them so that we can keep moving. So that when we are helping people, they're going because they're going to look at you. And they're going to say, well, you're helping me, but look at, all, you know, look at your front yard. It's brown and there's weeds all over the place. You know, why didn't you start there? And that's something that we need to do, right? We need to start where we're at. And then we need to start spreading that. And we need to start reaching out to other people. I think that a lot of times we have, we have a hard time with this. You know? I think that we, sin is something that creeps into your life. And one of the times when it creeps into, into your life is when you're just bored. You know, you just got some downtime, you don't have much going on, um, you're tired, whatever the case may be, and your mind is going to start playing some tricks on you. It's going to go down a rapid hill, and it's only down, okay? And it's going to lead to some bad thoughts, and it's going to lead you to some bad places. What can we do in those times, those times of boredom, those empty, empty times that we have? Well, we can reach out to our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's one thing that I know helps me is fellowship, right? If I, if I need an accountability partner, I, I'm not going to find him by not asking. Somebody's not going to just come up to me while I'm sitting down at a table and say, hey, I want to hold you accountable. <laughs> Has anybody ever had that happen to them? I know I haven't. Um, <laughs> they have to know what's going on in your life. And if they don't, then they're, they're not going to have any reason to say that to you. So reach out in those times where you're feeling lonely, where you're feeling empty, when you have some downtime, figure out what you can fill that with that's going to be positive in your life, what's going to grow you and move you in the right direction. And that's inevitably what's going to help with finding that freedom and being, being grateful for that freedom. So if we move on, we'll look at uh, verses 13 through 15. And this is kind of the heart of the message. It says, You, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Hmm. So we were called to be free. How cool is that? We weren't called to be, sin, or to be, to be locked into our sin. We weren't called to be prisoners of that sin. We're called to be free. God was like, I'm going to take care of you guys. You are called to be free. So in response, all it asks is that we love our neighbor. And I think that's pretty reasonable. I think that's a reasonable request in my opinion. Okay, I can definitely do that. Lord, I can definitely do that. Especially when I'm thinking about that image that I told you earlier about, about seeing Christ and him saying, Anthony, this is for you. That's when I say, you know what? It's not too bad for you to ask me to just love on some people and to help some other people. And so that phrase, you know, love your neighbors yourself, I feel like I've heard it before, maybe once or twice. I don't know if you guys have, but it seems to, seems to be kind of important or whatever. So uh, if we look at Leviticus 19.18, um, and Leviticus, I, granted, it's, it's kind of a little further back in the Bible, so like instead of starting from the back, if you went for the front, You'd only have to open like three chapters or three books, and then it would just kind of be there. So I know some people are like, wow, that's, you know, that's the Old Testament. That's a long time ago. It's not really relevant. Well, it's interesting because they just referenced it all the way here you know, toward the end of the New Testament. Um, see, the Old Testament, when I, when I got into church first, I was, you know, I was hanging out in youth group, and like I said, freshman year of high school, and I remember the youth pastor was like, all right, go ahead and everybody open up to the New Testament. And I got so excited. I was like, whoa, was like, when did they make a New Testament? I'm like, this is so cool. This is great news. And he's like, yeah, it is good news, isn't it? I'm like, yeah. Well, that's why they call it the gospel, I guess. So in Leviticus 19.18, says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So as I mentioned before, God is love. And we're, our desire is to love others and to live in that love. But... What does this look like for you? What can you do? Well, I'll tell you what it looked like for me. Um, when I was told that I was going to go work in South Korea as, as a soldier, 
right? I told you my job is a counselor, and uh, so I figured I was going to be doing just what I was trained to do, which is to go work in a clinic or a hospital of sorts and do entry-level counseling stuff with soldiers. And they're like, yeah, see, that would be for normal people, but you, you're not normal because for whatever reason, I always seem to get weird taskings, and so this was no different. They were like, hey, you're going to go work in a prison. I'm like, nice. And are you sure? And they're like, yeah, mm -hmm, pretty sure. <clears throat> the military is pretty rigid, I guess. You know, they don't really change their minds too often. So that's what I did. They sent me out to, to Korea to go work in, in a confinement facility where I was working with soldiers who had made mistakes while they were stationed out in South Korea. And uh, there was four, four prisons that I was in charge of out there as a behavioral health specialist. And uh, I was like, man, this is, this is going to be a challenge. Like, uh, God's got... He's got some interesting things to, to do through me here. I just got to get out of the way, and that's the hard part, right? Sometimes the hard part is just getting out of the way and letting God. And that's what I prayed when I got there. I was like, Lord, I'm going to have my judgments. That's just inevitable. There's not a lot I can do to get rid of those things. But what I can do is I can try and leave that at the door and let you take charge. And that's what I did as best as possible. But there were times where it was harder than others. You know, I was raised by my mom for the first 13 years of my life, and I have five sisters. So respect of women is just something that is just embedded into my life. It's just a part of who I am. And so I could sit there, and I could talk to murderers, and it would be fine. I would have no problems having a conversation with them. I could talk to you know, drug dealers, to thieves. But as soon as I found out that they had done anything, a male had done anything to a woman, I was just so hard. It was really hard for me to look them in the eyes and say, I'm here for you. That was really difficult. But you know what? God gave me the strength. And I looked them in the eyes and I said, as, as a behavioral health specialist in the United States Army, I am here for you to support you in whatever you need. They're doing their time. That's their punishment. I, I'm not there to give them any more punishment. So I was there to serve them. And that's what I did. Like I said, as best as I could. But all the glory goes to God for that because he was able to help me in that. Um, I was also <clears throat> given the blessing to work with one prisoner who was about 30, 30 minutes away from where we were stationed. He was, um, he was suicidal, and not just thoughts, but he was actively trying to kill himself. And fortunately, I had had some experience with, with helping people with that in the past, and so um, God was like, hey, I'd already given you some of this training. Here we go. Let's do it. And typically people of, of um, you know, it was my first duty station and kind of entry level, you know, we don't get the opportunity to do stuff like this, but my psychologist was like, hey, Anthony, we need you out there, and, and I'm confident that you'll do well. So I went out there and I talked to him, and I remember the inmate was just, you know, he's a sharp-looking guy, and, and, you know, looked like, you know, he just probably made a mistake here or there, and, and uh, it was going to be okay. But obviously that wasn't the case for, you know, his own mental status. He just wasn't, he wasn't in a good place. And so I remember at the beginning of our conversation, I asked him, I said, you know, what, what are the chances I can get you to tell me that in two weeks when I come back, you'll still be here? And he said, zero. The chances of that are zero. I, will, I cannot make any promises. As soon as you leave, I will try and kill myself again. By the end of the conversation, he looked me in the eyes and shook my hand, and he said, I'll give you two weeks. He said, you have my word. I will not try and kill myself in the next two weeks. And sure enough, two weeks later, I came back, and he was true to his word. Um, and I got another two weeks out of him and another two weeks. And eventually, I would have felt comfortable leaving that country knowing that this young man is he's still going to be there, and he's still going to fight the good fight, and he's doing really well, actually. And... And again, all the thanks to the Lord for that. Um, God provides when we ask him to. God provides when we open the door and say, Lord, I can't handle this on my own. This isn't for me, but I know you can. I know you can do it. And so I think when it all comes down to is in a sermon, you have to ask yourself, what, what, so what, right? What, what am I getting out of this sermon? What is Anthony trying to tell me? And here it is. We've all been given spiritual gifts. We've all been given different things that we are talented in, that we have a natural ability for, and that God has called us to do. And so how are you acting on those spiritual gifts? What are you doing with those gifts? We're all guilty of you know, using those gifts for our own good sometimes, or for ignoring them, or, or making it you know, like it's, it's just a, it's a blessing, but I'm not really going to have the time to serve the Lord with them. But 
invest into those. There's spiritual gifts inventories. You can go online. There's you know, resources and libraries, things like that. And figure out, if you never have before, what are your spiritual gifts? They have, they have a long list, and there's different, there's different ways that will tell you what you can do with them, what are some of your possibilities and your opportunities. And it's never too late. It's never too late to invest into those things and to invest in your church. You know, we all live in this general area, as far as I can tell. Um, nobody looks jet-lagged from flying in this morning, um, so I think, I think we're all right. Maybe one jet lag over here. Um, so anyway, what are you doing to invest in this area? What are you doing to say, hey, Lacey, hey, Olympia, how can I help you? How can I serve you? Or you're saying, hey, Paramount, what, what are you guys missing? What can I do for you? Okay? We're all aliens in this land. As far as I'm concerned, my home is up in heaven, and I can't wait to go home. But until that day, I'm a missionary. I'm in a foreign land where I get the opportunity to spread God's love and to shine it on other people. And so that's what I'm going to try and do. So I am a foreigner here in Lacey, Washington. I'm a foreigner wherever I go. And it's my objective to serve the Lord in all those places. So if you look at Matthew 18, or Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, it's called the Great Commission. Again, I think this is pretty popular, um, and some people have heard it before, but we'll go over it just to be sure. So it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. But the last part is what really gets me, and it's really what drives the point home to me. And it says, And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Do this for me, and I'll be with you always. If we serve the Lord and we look at God and say, how can I be best a tool for you? That's when God's going to say, I'm going to walk alongside you every step of the way. I'm going to be there with you. And he's done it for me, and I know he can do it for you. I am a sinner. I fall short of the glory of God. But at the end of the day, he's with me, and he's the reason that I have any kind of worth in this world. Today, if you have a decision to make or if you need some prayer, we'll have people in the representatives in the back and as well as in the front. Please come forward, and, and we'll, we'll help you out.